there will be a video in a minute about that. So, we have a cream tea coming up for the coronation next Saturday. And I hope you're all coming, because if you're not, I'm eating a lot of scones on my own with clotted cream and butter, and I do not want to be doing that. So please come, join in with us. It starts at 11 o'clock till 2. We've got all the scones, we've got all the jam, we've got the clotted cream, we've got the butter all sitting in the fridge. We have even have gluten-free scones. So please come for it, because it should be fun together. Oh, yeah, they're vegan as well. <laughs> I'm like, what was that sign over there? <laughs> I need him to write signs, really, don't I? you think after 39 years of knowing him that I'd be able to interpret, but it doesn't work. <laughs> we have an AGM on the 10th of May. Now, if you feel like this is your church, or even if you just want to find out more about this church, come on the 10th of May, 7.30, See what's gone on over the past year. But come and be excited about this place. Come and find your place here. If you don't know where you belong yet, come and find your place here. But hear what's going on. That actually should be really exciting. And I know when you see AGM, you think, oh, really? But actually, the last year's one was really exciting. I loved it. And actually just being together as well is part of that where we come and we share with each other and we share stories about what God's been up to in the past year with us. Come and find out. The Wholeness Project. Do you want to share anything about that? Yeah, yeah. As part of um, some of the other groups and things we've got going on, we have the Wholeness Project, which is a women's project that we launched uh, just after Christmas with a really nice brunch where we just wanted to see what God, what God wanted to say um, about a project for women's ministry in Telford and Shropshire. And we're going to have a prayer and worship night to continue to listen to God about that. And that is going to be on the 9th of May, the day before the AGM. Um, so uh, I apologise, they are two nights running. But if you are passionate about women's ministry across Shropshire and across Telford, we'd love for you to come along. We are, we are going to worship and we're going to listen to God and we're going to hear some stories. There isn't really an agenda, um, but we're going to see what God wants to do um, with, to help women encourage and strengthen women in the word of Jesus. Okay. On that diet. Whoa. James, would you like to come and share about street pastors? Hello everyone, I'm James. Uh, some of you know me, I'm part of Telford Minster, but what you might not know is that I am also a street pastor. I'm here with my friend and fellow street pastor, Teresa. Uh, and because it's sign-up Sunday, we wanted to come and give a notice about what's going on as street pastors and encourage you, if you think you might want to be involved, to come and talk to us. But I wanted to start by telling you a very quick story about a young lady I met a couple of years ago called Mary. Um, I met her in, on the streets in Birmingham. Mary was approaching different men and women asking for money when I met her, uh, and I was one of the um, intended targets. And when Mary came up and started speaking to me, uh, we had a nice chat. Mary uh, was a bit dirty in the way that she was dressed. Her hair was, was falling out. Um, she looked like she'd been under the effects of um, a drug and alcohol abuse, and she'd got various different cuts along her arms, um, that looked like self, self-harming. self So Mary was in a little bit of a mess. But what surprised me about this conversation with Mary was that it was just so ordinary. There was just this ordinary woman standing in front of me, having this conversation, asking me, you know, about my life and what was going on. And it struck me after that conversation that God put on my heart, I want to be able to, as a Christian, talk to men and women who find themselves in difficult circumstances out on the street. I want to be able to approach them. I want to be able to help them. I want to be able to talk to them about why I'm there, who, who I am, why I believe that Jesus loves them um, and, wants, and wants full life for them. And so I got in touch with Telford Street Pastors and, and the rest, as they say, is history. And today, Teresa and I are here because uh, after the service, when the Sign Up Sunday discussions are going on, we'd love to talk to you about if you've got a heart as a Christian for reaching people out on the street, or particularly on Saturday nights. So Telford Street Passes, we go out on Saturday night from about 10.30, we're on the streets, and we stay out until 4, 4 a.m., 
on the Sunday morning. Uh, and we go to the pubs and the clubs and we meet people who've had too much to drink. We meet people who uh, maybe are under the influence of drugs. We meet homeless people. We meet people who are just a bit vulnerable and need, need a friend. And we chat to all these people. We give out lollipops, flip-flops, uh, bottles of water, sick bags sometimes if necessary. And we're there to be Jesus' hands and feet on the, on the streets of Telford. So if you're interested and you want to find out more, come and speak to me and Teresa afterwards. And the beautiful thing about if you do street pastors is at four o'clock when you're going home, you get to hear the dawn chorus and it's absolutely beautiful. It's so loud because there's no other traffic about. So that's the added benefit of doing street pastors as well. So our final notice is about sign up Sunday. Woo! You meant to whoop again. Thank you. <laughs> so can we have the video please? Hey, you want to go and join one of the teams that I run? Well, I look after hosting, pastoral and our prayer teams. You want to get involved with them? You want to sign up? Come and chat to me. I'd love to talk to you more. Hi, I'm Pam and I get the privilege of working with the kids here at Telford Minster. So if you want to find out about Kids Church or our Minster Minis, which is a, a session for parents and toddlers and babies, or if you want to know more about schools, right, then come and chat to me. I'd love to tell you all about it. Want to know more about cleaning and using this big boy? Or getting chairs out on a Sunday or in midweek? Or learning the art of table rolling? Hey, if you want to come and find out more about that after this meeting or any other thing like keeping the building tidy or some of the odd jobs we've got going around the place, just see me and I can fill you in with a bit more information. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name is Nick and I'm the youth pastor here at Telford Minster. If you are passionate about discipling a generation of teenage change makers, then you should come and definitely talk to me this Sunday uh, to hear all about joining youth team for Friday Night Youth, Youth Drop-In, Sunday Socials and Schools Work. I'd love to talk to you this Sunday, our Sign Up Sunday, about the worship and media team. So whether you play an instrument, you sing, you are a budding photographer or a keen songwriter, come and grab me after church this Sunday and I'd love to talk to you more about the worship and media team. It's exciting, isn't it? There's that much that you can get involved with. And I cannot emphasize how much being part of one of these teams actually makes a difference. You think it's going to be hard work, and yet at times it is hard work. And sometimes when you're sitting at home, you're thinking, I really don't want to go in early. But actually when you come here, you're part of a team. It's an easy, easy way to get to know people. And there's something about giving of yourself into something and serving something that actually glorifies God as well. It's really good fun. I cannot emphasize how much good fun it is. I even love it. I've had the best conversations, because I'm usually on the hosting team. I've had the best conversations in the kitchen, washing up. And others can say yes to that as well. So please, come and sign up. Find out about something. Even if it's just once every time in a blue moon that you can help. Just come and find out about it. Talk to somebody that you saw on that video. Thank you. Christopher. Christopher is going to be reading from Acts 2, 14 to 41. And it's speaking boldly. Thank you. I feel I should begin by apologising to Carolyn because I'm wearing a hoodie that I'm not allowed to wear out of the house and um, it's like one of my bank holiday comfort hoodies and uh, she was playing in the band so I was bringing the children and completely forgot to change into something a little bit more fashionable so uh, you know <laughs> sorry about that. Um, this is one of my favourite passages of scripture. The Holy Spirit has just descended on Pentecost. Um, the, you know, you've had the, the tongues of fire. They've started speaking in all kinds of languages. And uh, they've been accused of being drunk. You know, why this weird behaviour at nine o'clock in the morning? Uh, and then Peter stands up. And so this is from verse 14. Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. 
Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your holy ones see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for Steph, and we pray that she speaks boldly today, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I'm Steph, I'm the Associate Vicar here at Telford Minster, and I'm going to speak to you and about speaking boldly. But one of the many talents... And one of my favourite things to do ever is just to speak. 
to talk. I am known as a chatterbox. I have been since I've been a little girl. The thing I was most told off about was for talking, um, regularly held back at playtimes and told um, every parent's evening, you have a lovely daughter, but she never shuts up. And then my mum would make that teacher late to the next person because she'd be talking so much. So it's inherited. And maybe this little baby that I'm carrying will also be a chatty one, and I apologise to their future teachers for that. But I'm also incredibly envious of those people that you, people comment on the fact they only speak when it's necessary. I seem to be absolutely unable to do that because I always want to say something. I've always got 50,000 things going around my head and I want to say something. But those people that do and speak with authority and clarity is something that I pray for. I pray deeply that I will be able to speak with, with boldness and authority in the way that Jesus does and the way that Peter does here and other disciples that we see and other people that I look to as well. So that is exactly what I get to talk about today. And I will try not to talk too much, as much as I love talking about Jesus and talking in general. I will try not to. But I'm going to be, I'm going to do a three-point talk. You'll be pleased. I'm not going to go through it line by line. That's a one heck of a passage. But I want to get three things across to you today. Number one, when we speak, it's about how we say it. The second point I want to I want to hope that will impact your heart today is knowing what it is that we're talking about. And the last one is why we should talk at all, especially when it comes to Jesus. So I'm going to dive right in by it's about how we say it. If I said to you, I believe in Jesus, but I said it with, I believe in Jesus. Or I said it with, I believe in Jesus. Or I said it, I believe in Jesus. Which one would you believe more? The last one, wouldn't you? You'd be more convinced by the last one. With a stamp of a foot and clearly showing that I believe in Jesus. And I do. Because the last way of saying it sounds like I really believe what I'm saying. But that statement, though, I am willing to take risks. I am willing to lay down my life for and to have confidence in it every single day of my life. We see bold people in history as well. We see Rosa Parks who declared what she believed in. We see the suffragettes who declared what they believed in. We see people like Mahatma Gandhi declare what they believed in as well. There's people through history that you can probably name in your hearts and your minds who stood boldly for what they believed in, for a better life for those people around them. They spoke out boldness to change society for the better. And in the end... They made history because world changes, history changes were never made. History was never made by the faint hearted. The world won't be changed by the faint hearted either. Not for the kingdom of God. Let me say those two things again. History is never made by the faint-hearted. And the world won't be changed by the faint-hearted either, not for the kingdom of God. Declaring and speaking boldly about what you believe can put your life on the line. It can also ostracize you from friends and family. It can make you look like the weird one in the room. But that is what we are called to as Christians, is to speak boldly. And ultimately, 
be history makers. A lot of youth things are labelled as make history makers because that's what they are. That's what we are. It doesn't stop when you're 18. That tagline doesn't in Christian youth groups. It carries on till our grave. It doesn't matter whether you are naught or you are 101. You still have the opportunities to speak boldly about what you believe. And Peter does exactly that in today's reading. He is speaking right after the Holy Spirit has come and filled the people. And no one really knows what's going on. They're all a bit confused and saying, these people are drunk. But Peter's explanation is that the disciples weren't drunk. But in fact, the Holy Spirit had come upon them. It was nine in the morning, too early to be drinking and much too early to be drunk. But those speaking in languages were not filled with wine, but they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And across these next 27 verses, it's Peter explaining what actually happened in those moments, what was actually going on. And he spoke that with boldness with authority to a group of people who really wanted to dismiss what had happened. They dismissed already who Jesus was. They dismissed the events that had already happened. And here, Peter is saying, no, that is not what is happening. They are not drunk. But actually, these people are filled with the Holy Spirit as prophecy has foretold. Jesus carried out. He died and rose for the get gain. He came back He sent the Holy Spirit as he promised on for us, for us today, for those people then. He had done just as he had said and what had been foretold in the scriptures. He is saying that when weeks earlier, this same Peter had denied his saviour with oaths and curses. His first denial was a girl at the door to a courtyard his second denial to a servant girl by a fire in the courtyard, and the third by a a man by the fire in a courtyard as well. Peter had taken a whole turnaround. Literally weeks earlier, he was denying who Jesus was. And now he is saying, this is who Jesus is. I believe in this. This is what is happening. He's speaking with boldness even though his life could still be on the line. The Holy Spirit had breathed a new courage into a once disheartened and discouraged disciple. But as Christians, I think that we often look like Peter in the denial phase of his ministry. I say this quite often in our staff meeting that I often feel like Peter. Because it's actually really easy to deny Jesus. You might think that you're living this best Christian life, but we can deny him with our actions by just shrugging who Jesus is off. We might deny Jesus simply because we can't be bothered to go into that topic today because it's too difficult. In my case, it might be surrounded by family and they ask a question or I want to correct them actually in something that they've said and say, but that's not what Jesus does. And every time I do that, I actually look back and I go, why did I just stamp on the face of Jesus? Why didn't I stick up for Jesus? Why didn't I say about my faith? Why did I have to push that comment off? Because I was too afraid to speak about Jesus in that moment. In those times, I've denied Jesus. And if we are all really honest with ourselves, we've been a bit like that too. We've chosen the easy option and not spoke boldly about our faith, but instead denied our faith instead. There's a film that is called Silence, and it's about uh, missionaries in 14th century Japan. Great for a date night. That's what I was taken on to see uh, once by my great husband. That's apparently Christian persecution is what his vicar wife wants to see. 
And in that film, there is a man who to me is a pure resemblance of Jesus, of not Jesus, of Peter and of us. Because to save themselves from the people who, who think that they're talking about Jesus, the Japanese authorities come along and make them stamp on a face of Jesus or, a, or like an image of Mary or a Christian imagery for them to show that they deny who Jesus is. That is what Peter did. But that man in this film, by the end of it, is killed for his faith because he no longer denies what he believes in. Peter, in the end, is killed for his faith because he no longer denied what he believed in and who he believed in. Peter, though, when he denied Jesus, had seen Jesus heal the sick, perform miracles, complete prophecies that were found in the Old Testament to raise people from the dead, yet he still doubted and denied Jesus. I think, though, what is great is that Jesus died on the cross for us. There is grace. There is opportunity for us to ask for forgiveness. But what we are called to do is to speak with boldness about what we believe. Because history won't be made, the kingdom of God will not be declared over the land if we do not speak with authority about what we believe. I have a friend called Lorraine who's literally known as the crazy Christian lady where I used to live on the Wirral in Merseyside. Her hairdressers would joke about her coming because every week, because she went for like her weekly perm or a weekly hair wash, would talk to them boldly about Jesus and her faith. I got to know these hairdressers and they would say, Lorraine's been at it again. She's been telling us about Jesus. I'm like, great, Lorraine. Keep on going. I don't know about you, but I want to be known as the Christian lady to my hairdressers who can't stop talking about Jesus. I'd rather be known for being strange and speaking with boldness about Jesus than be like everyone else. I'd rather my family roll, my, roll their eyes at me when I profess my faith. When I challenge them for something that they've done or something that they've said. Because I want to be a history maker for the kingdom of Jesus. I want to be used by Jesus to see Telford changed. But that's not for the faint hearted. And it's not always that easy. And but to also, coming on to point number two, to speak with boldness, we've got to know what we're talking about and who are the people that we are talking to. And Peter did. A mere fisherman, the lowest of the low, after everything that he had learned from Jesus, he presented evidence that Jesus is the promised Messiah to the people before him. He includes references to the Hebrew prophet Joel and the father of the nation, King David. He did this because he knew the devout Jews who knew that stuff would have carefully listened to what Peter had to say and about these scriptures. But Peter did know what he was talking about. He declared the scriptures and the word of God. He insists that this Pentecost event is the fulfillment of the prophecy that was said by Joel. Peter also asserts that Jesus is referred to in the Hebrew scriptures and spoke of the coming Messiah. With tongue of urgency, Peter ended Joel's prophecy by asserting that this is the time to recognize the Messiah and put one's faith in him. Everyone who would be willing to do so, Joel said, would be saved. How cool is that? Up to this point, Peter urged the Jews that they should recognize the miraculous phenomenon as manifestations of the Spirit, signaling an end time of the Spirit. But Peter says, and Joel's prophecy applies to this day and for the days to come, that the Spirit had come and was going to stay. He addresses his listeners as people of Israel and those who claim to be God's people. 
If they are God's people, Peter is saying, they will recognize the work of Jesus as being described in their scriptures. And there are a number of scriptures that he uses to demonstrate this in in the passage from today. But particularly two Psalms. So Psalm 16 being the first. And Psalm 16 is, speaks of one who will not see decay, nor be abandoned to the grave. This person is always in the presence of God. And Peter asserts that this statement could not apply to King David. He stresses that all the listeners knew that David was dead and buried. So the scriptures actually must be referring to Jesus. I feel like Peter's like going, hey, look over here you've got that bit wrong and look over here, you've got this little bit wrong too because this is, this is actually about somebody else. It says in Psalm 110 as well, um, was another reference, sorry, that Peter um, used. Following Jesus, Peter insisted that the Lord to whom the invitation was addressed was the Messiah. Again, not David. David didn't figure in the account at all in this messianic sense, in the the Jesus sense. After all, he did not ascend to heaven to sit at God's right hand like Jesus did. And Peter stressed what weighs in the view was the unique son of Jesus. The text speaks of heavenly enthronement, not one on earth. Indeed, Jesus had predicted to the Jewish leaders that the son of man will be seated at the right hand hand of almighty God. Peter really tried to make clear what had gone before and that those things were fulfillment of prophecies. And he knew how to appeal to his audience and of his own experience too. He says that if, um, he is implying that if these Jews had been in Jerusalem since before Passover, Passover, and especially if they lived in the city, they would have known of Jesus' miraculous works, and especially the circumstances surrounding his death. So we spoke of that too. He says, a fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried And his tomb is here this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him an oath and he would be placed as one of his descendants on the throne. Peter knew what he was on about. He wasn't just standing there making no sense like the other people around them. He knew what he was saying And it's also clear from the future things that Peter says, his future speeches, that he knew what he was on about too. There were set themes that were used in those speeches that are repetitive as he speaks to the people and the early church is formed. He knew what he needed to say. He'd been prepared by Jesus as a disciple. He'd done his homework. He knew what he needed to say. If I stood here today and didn't know what I was talking about, or if Peter stood up and didn't know what he was talking about, or Rosa Park sat on that bus not knowing what she was talking about, things would never change. You'd all think if I stood up here and said a whole load of gobbledygook that I'd gone absolutely loopy and you'd be very confused and probably wouldn't want to come to church or especially if you knew I was speaking. You might feel like that anyway. But it also doesn't mean to talk about your faith and profess your faith and to speak boldly that you need a PhD from Cambridge or being a Christian for hundreds of years. Knowing what you're talking about when you're speaking boldly about your faith is about walking with Jesus. It's about reading your Bible daily or listening to your Bible or however you, uh, you engage with scriptures in your walk with Jesus. It's about praying. It's about asking God to equip you in tricky circumstances or when you're sat on a bus and someone comes up to you and asks you where you're going and you're actually going to church 
And you're able to have that moment to say, God, help me tell this person about Jesus. Knowing what to say or who to say it to. Knowledge and being the best theological scholar in the world doesn't matter. You can all do it. You can all tell people about Jesus, but it's about walking with him every day. Because believe it or not, a comment you make to somebody on a bus or to somebody at the work, you do not know what ripple effects that is going to have. You don't know what seed of faith that might plant. So that little child that you know and love to tell them, Jesus loves you. You don't know what that person, that little child might go on to do. They could be an ex-Archbishop of Canterbury, for all you know. They could be the next most senior doctor. You don't know. But if we aren't willing to disrupt, then things aren't going to change. We'll just be Christians in our nice little bubble, walking along nicely all together, being smiley with one another. And people's lives out there will not be changed. Which brings me to my final point of why do we need to speak boldly? Why do we need to know this stuff? Why do we need to walk with Jesus? Well, we want to see people's lives change, don't we? We know, if you know and love Jesus, you know what a difference knowing Jesus makes what he makes to your life. Why hide that? Why keep that as your big secret? Why not profess it instead? It says that the people, when they heard this message from Peter, were cut to the heart. Having your heart sliced open doesn't sound very nice, does it? Sounds quite painful. But their hearts were cut. The enormity of what had just happened crashed into their consciousness. The man they had spit on, crucified, was their Messiah, and he was now sitting in the power at God's right hand. Moved by the Holy Spirit and their own participation in the persecution of Jesus' death, they were now humbled and teachable. And it was probably quite natural to, for them to wonder and um, ask in trepidation, what shall we do? And Peter says to them, repent, be baptized. Repent. In the Greek, that word repent is metanoia. And it appears frequently throughout our New, New Testament in the book of Acts. And it literally means change of mind, change of heart. It's like a whole complete change. Repentance and conversion are, have a from and to movement. Once one goes away from an old way of thinking in which they denied God, they spat on Jesus into living a whole life professing Jesus instead. It is a big change. And that baptism meant receiving the Holy Spirit as well. Baptism, you know, dunking people in water and asking the Spirit to fill them. And everyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. That speech, Peter declared, was so, so, so powerful that 3,000 people were saved that day. These people were the start of the early church and spread it wide and far. The reason we need to be bold is to see people become followers of Jesus, to see lives and places and families and cities changed. And it starts with us. It starts with us. If you need 
help and encouragement in any of these things. If you want to journey more as a Christian, you want to grow more, sign up, sign up to something. But you could also sign up to one of the other things we've got going on, like our villages and our groups, as you could walk alongside other Christians and grow in faith to be able to profess and speak more boldly about who you know and love as your life and um, as your Lord and Savior, as you become whole life apprentices of Jesus. So, speaking boldly. It's not always about the words that you say, but it really matters about how you say it. But when you, it does actually matter though when you speak those words, because it matters that you know what you're talking about. And who you are going to speak to. But don't be afraid about that. Because God will equip you. God will give you everything you need. Even if it sometimes isn't the easiest thing to do. Even if it comes with a slight backlash. It is worth doing. Because it's worth telling people about Jesus. It's worth helping people's lives be transformed and then become whole life apprentices of Christ. Now, I want to invite you to stand. And I invite you to do this as kind of an acknowledgement of uh, what you've heard, uh, but also to say to God, I'm in. Um, And I'm going to pray for us and we're going to just wait and see what the Holy Spirit has to say. And if you just come in as well uh, from Kids Church and you have learned something or you have heard Jesus say something to you today, I know you've been learning about being unique, uh, then come and share that as well. Come and tell us what you feel God's saying as well because we'd love to hear that as well because we're one big family. You might even find it helpful just to offer out your hands as a way to say, God, I'm here. I'm ready to receive. So, Lord God, we come before you this Sunday afternoon. And we pray, will you fill us? Will your Holy Spirit fill this church and us. Will you help us to become more bold, to speak boldly about our faith, to speak with authority, to have the knowledge to do and the the confidence to be able to. Will you come?